One second. Uh, hi, I'm Madeline. I'm a volunteer at VanVeg, and today we are watching the live stream at UBC. If you have any questions, I just raise your hand and I'll make sure it gets to the moderators on the other side. Okay, great. Uh, hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, on our uh, November Van Bug seminar. Um, just a reminder, uh, if you haven't already, please silence your phones. Um, and also, if you didn't see the pop-up that just showed up before, uh, the event's being recorded. Um, so uh, this is the first year we're kind of doing this setup where we have the seminar in the morning. Um, this is just a reminder of our schedule. So once we finish these announcements, we're going to have the uh, introductory speaker talk and then um, the featured talk. And after that, we're going to have some pizza and some drinks so you guys can kind of like chat and chew and all that. Um, Van Bug is a, a student-run volunteer organization um, aided with the help of some of our um, faculty members, um, Dr. William Shao, uh, Dr. Amy Lee, and Dr. Faraz Hotch, um, as well as some of the volunteers you have there. Not a complete list of the people who make this work, but um, yeah. Uh, coming up in the future, in the latter half of this season, we have uh, these upcoming Van Bug events. Um, if you would like to be uh, kind of reminded of anything we have going on, uh, that uh, you can send an email with the subject line subscribe to that email. Um, and we'll send out uh, reminders of kind of events we have going on, whether that's talks or special events like uh, lightning talks or things like that. And yeah. Um, as well, there's the calendar there if you need to, uh, if you need something a bit more visual as a reminder. Um, we base uh, the people who are going to be hosting off of um, kind of your guys' suggestions. So if you guys have any anybody, any uh, faculty, any person you know that you think would be um, interesting to hear speak, uh, you can go onto our website um, and let us know. We are sponsored by, we've been sponsored by for a long time, the Graduate Students in Bioinformatics um, at the University of British Columbia and Simon Fraser uh, University, um, as well as Genome uh, BC uh, for, I think, 10, 15 years, the two of them. And um, big thanks to SFU Big Data Hub and the Michael Smith Laboratories for uh, hosting our uh, split um, our split uh, venues, um, as well as Langara College and our um, industry sponsor stem cell technologies. Um, Vanbug is also uh, affiliated with the ISBC and our sister bugs, Monbug and Torbug. Um, for the people who are in the Zoom audience, um, ask your questions in the chat and event, or actually, um, people in the Zoom audience, you can ask your questions in the chat and a Vanbug volunteer will voice it for you. Um, the people who are at our uh, SFU uh, venue that's streaming this um, presentation, you can uh, just pose your questions to the Venbo volunteer there and they'll bring it up um, when we open up the floor for questions after the uh, presentations. Our first speaker is going to be uh, Darlene Dye. Um, they're a PhD student in experimental medicine at the Turvey Lab at UBC. Um, and their uh, presentation title you can read there. Um, and following that, we'll have our featured talk um, from Dr. Michael Baim, an associate professor at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. Unless I got that wrong. Oh, yeah, you did. Okay. But close enough. You're <laughs> close enough. <laughs> Well, anyways, <laughs> my sources are incorrect. Um, okay, great. If you'd like to come up and. Okay, I'm trying to share the slides. It's not on my slides. 
Have we already shared the screen? Yes. Yeah. So thank you for the introduction and thank you everyone for coming to listen to our talk. I'm very delighted to share our story with you today. Is it working? No? It's uh, share screen. Share. And then we're going to share screen. And I see. Right here. Okay, great. So uh, to begin with, asthma is the most common chronic childhood disease affecting approximately 3 million Canadians. And over the past half century, the risk of asthma increased dramatically, suggesting that something about our environment contributing to the current asthma prevalence. One important component that bridges the environment exposures and the host physiology is a microbiome which develops and matures at the same time as the infant's immune system. In addition, the developing microbiota is very sensitive to early life exposures, and researchers have found that the disrupting microbiota in early life could have long-lasting impacts on infant's health. Because of this, microbiota has become a popular target for understanding and preventing asthma development. So to explore how environmental factors and infant microbiota Association of asthma development. We use the child cohort study, which is the largest population based birth cohort in Canada. Child study enrolled more than 3,000 subjects since pregnancy from four sites across Canada. And in addition to the environmental and the clinical assessment data, child study also collected two samples during the first year of life, which allows us to explore the changes within the infant microbiota and understand how they associated with asthma diagnosis at five years of age. And the story today I will present will focus on this time period up to five years, but the child study continues and we are currently seeing participants for their 13 year visits. And our story all starts with this project we published in Lancet Respiratory Medicine in 2020, in which we found that Early life antibiotics exposure was associated with elevated asthma risk. And this antibiotic associated asthma risk was significantly mediated by the changes in infant gut microbiota. Furthermore, we also find consistent results using population level data. And in collaboration with Dr. David Patrick from BC Center of Disease Control, we found that an overall we find an overall decrease of childhood asthma prevalence from 2000 to 2014 in British Columbia, which is significantly associated with the reduced antibiotics usage in infants. It is encouraging to see the success of antibiotic stewardship in infants in BC. However, we do acknowledge that while not all vaccine drugs, some do. So how do we prevent infants from developing asthma where antibiotics are necessary? The answer to this came from a question proposed by our collaborator, Dr. Megan Azel. And she asked, does breastfeeding could modulate this antibiotic associated asthma risk? Due to the fact that breastfeeding is a major modular of the infant gut. To answer that, we again harnessed the child cohort study to interpret the breastfeeding effect. We parse the general antibiotic exposure by categorizing it as either antibiotics uh, while breastfeeding and antibiotics without breastfeeding. After adjusting for covariance compared to children with no antibiotic exposure, children who take antibiotics without breastfeeding had a significantly higher risk of asthma with an adjusted odds ratio equal to 2.98. While the adjusted odds ratio for children who receive antibiotics while breastfeeding was only 1.2 and not significant. Furthermore, this near threefold reduction in asthma odds was still there or directly compare children who take antibiotics with and without breastfeeding. And all these analyses have already adjusted for the breastfeeding duration and the relevant covariance. These results demonstrate that being breastfed at the time of antibiotic usage could rescue asthma risk to near non-antibiotic exposure levels. The next, we want to understand what role the infant microbiota played in this observation. So we examined the infant gut microbiota in subsamples by using the shotgun metagenomic sequencing. 
which could not only provide microbiota abundance, telling us who is there, but also functional data, telling us what are they doing and who is doing what. And in my project, we used the functional CAG ocelot data, which could provide the microbiome functions based on gene families with uh, similar functions. By using the methylene 2 analysis, a total of six CAG ocelots was significantly associated with all the three phenotypes. And five of them were consistent in directions, which were negatively associated with asthma and reduced by antibiotics exposure without breastfeeding, but enriched by breastfeeding. And among the five CAG ocelots, three of them were ABC transporters. One was involved with cellular growth or spore formation, and one was involved with semi folate metabolism. These five CAG ocelots provided an an excellent clue of how breastfeeding may be impacting this antibiotic association asthma risk, but we are curious about which microbiomes were responsible for them. So by stratifying the CACs by which species contain these genes, we narrowed our focus on the top five species contributing to the overall abundance to the five CACs. The colored block indicate if the horizontal species were the top five contributors to the vertical CAC. And as you can see, this species, Bifidobacterium and Longum, was a major contributor to all these five CAG ocelots. In addition, as shown in the right side figures, Bilongum's contributions were significantly reduced, both in antibiotics without breastfeeding and asthma, and significantly elevated with the presence of human milk. And I will provide more details about the right side plots. So each of these five plots corresponds to each CAG ocelot and it shows the coefficients of the belongums contribution on these three phenotypes. The purple dot is for breastfeeding, the pink one for asthma, and the light purple for antibiotics without breastfeeding, and the light blue for antibiotics while breastfeeding. And as you could see for all these five CAG ocelots, belongums contributions were also associated with the, the three phenotypes in consistent directions. These results indicated that Belongum is a key player in our observation for this antibiotic association asthma risk. However, this was not reflected by the overall abundance of belongum, which was not significantly associated with asthma by itself at all. So we had to ask whether subspecies or strand level differences could explain our observations. The reason we jumped to this hypothesis is that Belongum is made of three distinct subspecies, which are Belongum longum, Belongum infantis, and Belongum soys. So by comparing the Belongum genes within our samples and the reference genomes of the three subspecies, we identified a distinct cluster of 11% of the one-year samples primarily colonized by the Belongum subspecies. And we also know that Belongum is a key stone species within the infant gut which is enriched for HMO utilizing genes, supporting microbiome function stability, promote mucosal integrity, and immune system development. Furthermore, when we looked at the antibiotic association risk in children enriched with either Bimfantize or other subspecies, we found that the relative abundance of Belongum was only significantly associated with reduced asthma risk in infants containing Bimfantize. So up to this point, our data implies that breastfeeding enrichment of bifidase may rebalance the infant microbiota following antibiotic exposure and ultimately reduce the risk of developing asthma at five years. But breastfeeding is not always an option during the early antibiotic exposure. And ultimately, we would like to protect these infants as well. So in the next step, we collaborated with Dr. Mignazet and Dr. Lars Bordy to explore which components in breast milk such as human milk oligosaccharides may be used to support the bean infantized colonization. So again, we applied the methylene to analysis to the subset samples, either with or without the bean at one year. And we found three HMOs, which was the LNFP3, LNFP2, FDSLNH, which you can see they all three clustered together, uh, positively associated with the bean infantized. And these HMOs might be great candidates for the downstream studies that look at the supplementation to children who cannot be breastfed during antibiotic exposure to reduce the antibiotic associated asthma risk. So to summarize, we identified clear protection from asthma when children are breastfed at the time of antibiotic exposure. 
and this protection may be in part due to the breastfeeding's effect on enriching being vaginas. And our findings have um, been published in MED early this year. And with that, I would like to thank Dr. George Terry, our fellow lab members, collaborators, and funding support that allows us to do this research. And thank you. And any comments and questions are welcome. So yeah, we'll open up the floor to some questions for a little bit. Does anyone have any? Do we have any from the Zoom or from the SFU location? Uh, you, your question is, uh, do you have some demographic uh, uh, variables also associated with as well? Yes. Some sort of parallel study happening somewhere else, and does this have some sort of similar keystone species that meet on them in them? Yeah. So actually, we also have um, in Denmark, uh, we collaborated with uh, another birth cohort, which is called COPSAC. They have very similar setups. So they enrolled the babies um, since pregnancy as well. And we also looked at their data for the beam and uh, But they use a different uh, pipeline. But uh, we do see very similar patterns, like the beam and uh, they also like uh, shows up in their things. And we use their pipeline, we found very similar results. Yeah. Questions? None currently from the SF, SFU okay. location. Anyone else? Uh, if not, thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Baim. Um, Dr. Baim is an assistant professor in the Harvard uh, uh, Medical School in Biomedical Informatics and Microbiology, uh, Microbiology Department. Um, <laughs> uh, the, Dr. Baim uh, has uh, been recipient of a numerous uh, and prestigious award, and some of them are Packard Foundation, Sloan Foundation, and Pew Charitable Foundation, uh, Pew Charitable Trust Awards. Um, uh, Dr. Baim is a microbiologist and applied mathematician uh, whose uh, fo research focus is on uh, bacterial evolution and particularly in uh, antibiotic resistance. Um, his lab uh, combines uh, computational and experimental methods uh, to study a range of topics. And most recently, um, he has been focusing on evolution of plasmids and uh, bacteriophages. Uh, probably one of the most well-known works of Dr. Baim is his giant two by four uh, Petri dish where on which you can actually see the evolution of uh, antibiotic resistance in real time. And uh, with that, I would like to open the floor for Dr. Baim to present uh, his talk for us. I'm gonna share it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I got it. Why would it smile so you like this? Yep. Um, and then the share is not going. Let me restart it. Not yet, it will. Now it should be working. Hello? Yeah, yep, it's working. And everyone in the other campus, you can hear me? I don't know if they can hear me, but... Um, so I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, particularly at UBC and particularly in 2023, because I think what very few people know, and I don't even think my lab knows this, um, is that in 20, the last time I was here, it was 2003, 20 years ago, when I was coming to UBC, because this is where I thought I was going to graduate school until MIT changed their mind. Um, 
I was going to come here and do a PhD in mathematics uh, and analytic number theory. Um, I've gone pretty pretty far afield from that, uh, as as you can see. But um, in the in the spirit of moving from math to computation, because Amy invited me to give a talk today and tomorrow, um, today is going to be actually a completely computational talk. Um, while I've been doing a lot of experiments recently, I've tried to keep one foot in computation, and I figured, you know, as a as bioinformaticians. Um, I would try to tell you about some of the computational work we've been doing, how it relates to evolution. And generally, um, I wanted to give you a talk about designing algorithms for data that comes from comes from real things. So I want to start with something that everyone here, well, I, I want to start with something um, that everyone here definitely remembers. So January 5th, 2020, the World Health Organization tweeted that on the 31st of December, the WHO learned of 44 cases of an unknown pneumonia. Um, well, we all know, you know, what happened very rapidly thereafter. And actually, in one of what I think is the great technological triumphs of our of our time, just a week after that, um, the full sequence of SARS-CoV-2 was on GenBank, or on SRA. Um, and so, you know, someone, not us, someone who had thought about it more had this idea, well, why don't we just search the SRA for things that look like new viruses? Search the entire SRA. Uh, that work ended up getting pre-printed on August 10th, um, in part because they had to build entirely new computational techniques for looking at SRA because it was so big. Uh, for comparison, just two days after that was the Nature paper on the phase two trials of the first mRNA vaccines. So this is really all to say that, you know, in our modern world, computation is becoming it's not quite there yet, but in some cases, and increasingly more, it's becoming compu comparably heavy to doing experiments. Um, and so, well, we all we all know what happened. Evolution kept going. Um, and I started worrying about this a bit further back uh, because I noticed back when I was a graduate student, Bonnie, um, something that I think has now become cliche, this idea that sequencing was growing faster than Moore's law, at least it was at the time, right? And I want to just put in perspective how profound this period of development was. So this was about a factor of 10 every year in sequencing power for about a decade. That's... I. I'm struggling to think of any technological advance period of technological advance in human history that's had anything like that, um, present day included. So for for an example, that's like that's like going from this Osborne executive to a, the first iPhone. Um, this was from the Moore's Law. You know, this is from the Wikipedia page on Moore's Law showing look at this incredible progress that happened in 25 years. Um, it's like doing that in three. Of course, it didn't last forever, right? There was just as soon as people started worrying a lot about this bubble, as with most things, it ended. Um, weirdly well-timed with Illumina's monopoly, but, and then that drop is, is really right around when that started to break. Um, but there's still a problem. And there's, and all of you know this problem. Because how many people here have used BLAST? Yeah, everyone. You've all used BLAST. This is the first thing you do when you see a sequence of DNA. You blast it and you're like, well, let me just blast it against NR and see what I find, right? Um, of course, you know, now it's discontinued, right? It's it's mega blast because if you just do traditional blast, it takes like 20 minutes per query. Um, and this is really a problem because it's slow and it's not getting any faster. 
In fact, it's getting slower. And it's not only is it getting slower, it's actually getting worse. Um, and I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. So, you know, while I started worrying about this, this question, I guess around a little over a decade ago, there's been you know, many other people did it at the same time, and there's been a lot of progress on this, right? Um, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with these Kamer based approaches. I'm a real fan of this, this work, Big Z by Zam Iqbal and Company, um, came out about three years ago, which is real time Kamer search. Um, almost looks like Google. I think they even copied the colors. Um, and then there've been some more other ones that do some alignment, but they all still have the same basic problem, right? Which is the number of genomes that we have is just growing faster than our computer capability. Uh, this is the number just on bacteria. This is the number of bacteria in NCBI assemblies. That's the storage on your iPhone. Uh, and that's blast that's blast nr um it's actually getting exponentially worse so the proportion like not only is blast not getting faster because computers while they're getting faster they're sort of throttling it but in fact the proportion of sequenceable data or searchable data with blast is exponentially decreasing in part to deal with this um and so this got us thinking, how do we how do we beat this exponential decrease, right? You know, there's this really fundamental problem that if your data is growing, if the thing you are trying to do computation on is growing on a faster exponential than your computers are getting faster, then functionally your ability to ask reasonable questions of it is getting exponentially worse despite the improvements in computation. Um, this is this is actually really bad, right? Because any linear time algorithm suffers from this. Meaning even just looking at your data, even just counting what you have suffers from this. Um, and, you know, the, the first thought is, well, and I think this is, I think people have started to sour on this finally. But, you know, the first thought is, well, this is just going to be solved by cloud computing, right? The, the problem is, of course, cloud computing is still constrained by Moore's law. And I, I thought I would make fun of it with this cloud that shut down Europe a few years back. Um, <laughs> because, you know, cloud computing, uh, it was, you know, it was seen as this sort of cheap, limitless resource. And now, you know, I just have a friend who uh, got a surprise $50,000 bill from uh, AWS because a loop was written wrong. You know, so this is suddenly becoming um, comparable or even more expensive than experiments actually for a lot of, for a lot of labs. Uh, but the realization was that, you know, there's an assumption in this, in this sort of feeling of, oh no, we can't, Oh no, we're 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 on a losing exponential, and the assumption is that we have to look at all the data, right? If anything, I mean, in some sense, it's sort of obvious, right? If if the only way that you, if any algorithm that looks at all the data and thus is linear time or worse, is slowing down exponentially, then the only solution is not to look at all the data. But we can do that. And the reason we can do that is that genomes aren't arbitrary. That even if one genome is not super compressible, multiple ones are. You know, these are identical quintuplets, so there's very little redundant. There's very little um, non-redundant genomic data in that picture. But you know, even in this room, there are like what thirty of us here. We're ninety-nine point nine percent similar, and there's some. In some intuitive sense, if I run some computation on my genome, it should not take 30 times longer to run it on genomes of every single person in this room. Because if we're 99% similar, then for almost any question you might ask of my genome, you've already done most of the work to answer it on yours. It should just take marginally longer for each one. 
And so we had this idea of, of using compression for acceleration. Um, and this is something that, you know, I'm gonna start by talking about what work on it that we did over a decade ago now, but get into some modern things because I think finally after, you know, after years in the woods as an experimentalist, I've come back and I think we've built what I think is is the next generation of this. Um, and so our original thought was let's let's go after blast. So compression. The basic idea of compression is you've got some string, right, or some object, and all you're doing is you're saying, let's find regions that are similar to each other and replace one region with a pointer to another. You, you replace a region that's sufficiently similar with a pointer to another region that has the same data. That's the idea of essentially all, really all compression. Um, but this doesn't work super well with things like BLAST because um, the optimal compression doesn't always respect the the structure of the algorithm. It's not doesn't compression. If you sort of optimally compress, you throw it into gzip. The way that gzip compresses doesn't often lend itself to the kinds of questions that you want to ask, which means that you have to decompress before you can search it. That's a problem. Um, you also have this issue that while there's a lot of work on exact matching, you really don't when you're searching for a genome using BLAST, you don't want exact matches. You want things that are sort of like it, right? You want things that are a couple mutations away because the chance of those sharing a common ancestor are extremely high. And so you want to catch those. Um, but there is some strong sense in which the questions that we're asking in biology are, what is like what, right? Almost everything you're asking when you when you blast, when you honestly, when you deal with almost any sequence, you're really most of the questions you ask are what is like this sequence and what is not like this sequence. That's not exactly compression, but it's a close approximation. And so we can exploit one as a proxy for the other. Right. And so the idea was that maybe we could compress in such a way that things that would be blast hits were usually compressed near each other. Um, so in 2012, we published this, this paper where we introduced compressively accelerated blast, which had you know, two steps. Um, I put just search here because we also plopped in blast at the time and since then a few other things and it just works. The point is not blast, the point is the, the algorithm. So. Basically, the thought was, okay, what we could actually do is build a database, put some computation on the front end, and then make search fast by just uh, identifying the things in the original database that were similar to each other or close enough, replace that with just the most... And we really, at the time, we did the absolute most naive compression you could imagine. There was nothing fancy about this. The point was... Actually, the point was explicitly to do something almost laughably naive to show that the idea of compression to accelerate algorithms was actually the powerful thing. So we did the simplest way you could possibly compress something. We just went through it. And every time we found a string that was like something previous within some threshold, we replaced it with a link plus a list of mutations. That's, that's it. Then to search, what we did is we did a blast search against just this unique database, but with a relaxed threshold. And then it, everything that it hit, we then followed, decompressed, and then just ran it again. And the idea there is that you know, if these two sequences differ by one mutation or two mutations, then anything that hits this one by blast should hit that one, although maybe with a slightly worse score, right? And so the major problem when you do search 
especially with a giant data set like database like that, the major problem that you actually have is ruling stuff out. Right? Most of your time when you blast is not spent figuring out what things are like what you're looking at. Most of the time is spent ruling out the like 999 dot 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 fraction of the database that is nothing like what you're looking at. And so the thought was, you know, this is a very fast way to use a, this this naive compressed database to rule that out. And then you can be slower on the different links because you're pretty sure there's going to be a rich variety of hits in there. And this worked pretty well. Um, you know, it, it compressed well, it scaled well, both in runtime and file size uh, on both Blast and Blat. And yes, I this was real. I don't know what this is. There, at least at the time, there was some hidden flag in Blat that changed what it did as the database size changed and it suddenly got faster. Um, and there was this nonlinearity and we tried and tried to track down what was happening or non-monotonicity and we just we just couldn't, but it's okay. No one uses Blat anymore. Um, and so we introduced this idea of compressive genomics, which Bonnie and other people in the lab have taken, or in my graduate lab took, you know, protein sequences, metagenomics, et cetera. Um, but, but my vision of this was not to use this sort of simple neighborhood compression, but rather to do a hierarchical clustering, right? Because if you think about when you compress like this, you're not actually beating the exponential because these, these links, they sort of star, you can sort of think of it as stars, right? This goes to a bunch of other places. Those become the limiting factor. I mean, the only way that you actually get exponential uh, compression, which is what you need, really the only way you sort of get anything exponential in computer science is there has to be a hierarchical structure, right? There has to be something where you can traverse it, where you can traverse it down in a number of steps that's logarithmic in the size of the database. Mm -hmm. um, Bonnie's student then took this, oh my God, why am I blanking on his name? I worked with him. <sighs> Sorry, this is terrible. Um, took this further and showed actually what this was, was um, doing computation in time proportionate to the entropy of the data. So basically proving that if there is some high dimensional space that data lives in, but it actually lives in a low dimensional subset of that that can be tiled with these compression balls, then you could sort of only have to search these balls Time is sort of proportionate to the number of balls it takes to tile the data, not the whole search. Um, and that this should work for a wide variety of problems where data lives on some low dimensional manifold inside a larger space. But this still gets to this practical challenge, right? How do you actually identify redundancies? Uh, there's a bunch of ways to do it. Dictionary compressors, gzip, statistical, Kamer matching. Um, in general, this, they're difficult to scale up. And so actually gzip is still used more commonly than, than anything else because it just works. Um, and as, as a microbiologist, um, I was sort of extra interested in this because microbes are super hard, right? Microbes are, they're short, they're incredibly diverse. They don't have these giant repeat regions. They're just really a pain. Um, and, and so I want to talk about some compression of microbes. Now, at this point, you're probably thinking, I, I thought this was a talk about evolution, <laughs> right? Um, I, I did call it that. So what does evolution have to do with this? So I want to, I want to ask a question to you which is thinking about a collection of genomes. What, what sets the fundamental limit on the information content of a collection of genomes?
right? A collection of genomes has to have, it can't be unlimited. Naively, you could say, well, it's the length of the genome times, you know, it's it's two to, the, it's four to the length of the genome times the number of individuals. That gives you a number that's, you know, thousand, a million orders of magnitude too large. Um, it's definitely not that. So I want to, I want to start and say, you know, it's, it's what sets the limit of the information content of any process of sort of the output of any physical process is the entropy of that process. It's the amount of randomness, the amount of new information introduced as these things come to be. So, you know, we often start, at least for those on the more theoretical computer science side, with, with statements like, let the genome be a string, dot, 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 dot. Um, and I think if there's one thing that I want you to take from this, this whole bit, it's that you need to not stop there. That really what you actually want to say is let the genome be a string that is the product of a sparse evolutionary process. Because that's really what sets the limit. That you know, all of life initiated from a common ancestor. And that common ancestor, and over time, right, the information, the variation between them was introduced in a way that actually is exactly how we infer this phylogeny. This, this is the same as, as parsimony. Um, and so if you're trying to get at sort of the absolute bound of how much you can compress a genome, the, the absolute bounds of how much you can compress genomes is their history. It is this tree that connects them because that's the minimal representation of how the entropy in that set of genomes came to be there in the first place. Um, and, and that's the insight that knowing the evolutionary history of these objects, knowing it's really knowing that they are the progress, that they are the product of evolution, not just random strings. That was the real key that broke it all open. Um, more formally things that are closer in the tree to one another tend to be more mutually compressible. And this actually is should really not be surprising, both because um, it makes sense logically, but also because that's literally how you draw this tree. Um, and there's some ideas like this that are being used in metagenomics. Kraken uh, profile uses it. So my postdoc and I worked on that recently, et cetera. And so what I'm going to tell you now about is, is some work done by my former postdoc, Carol Jinda, who is, uh, now runs his own group at Inria and Rennes. And his work, at least in the later part of his postdoc, focused on this idea of phylogenetic compression. Um, uh, what, he, what I'm talking about here is actually one of two steps of phylogenetic compression. This is sort of the more, the more subtle one, uh, but the low level one, which is basically when you have a list of strings to compress, his insight was compressors tend to work better if things that are compressible to each other are close to each other in the original file. And so literally taking a list of genomes and reordering them so that in that file list, things that are more close in the tree are closer to one another um, actually dramatically increases their compressibility uh, in a very similar way to the, how the Burroughs-Wheeler transform does it, which, I mean, if I'm being dead honest, I don't have a strong intuitive sense of why it works, but I know that it does. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the basic example was let's, for a small collection of assemblies, was just infer a phylogeny using anything, mash tree is great, order it, compress, and this seems to work. But uh, but Carell was not satisfied there because he thought, well, you know, why, why limit ourselves to small things if we're worried about big things? Why not go as big as we possibly can? Uh, so 
we decided we started working with Zam Iqbal over EBI because they've got some really giant collections. So we started with 448,000 uh, De Bruyne graphs from the Big Z database, which is about 16, 16.7 terabytes of data. Um, and then also from Grace Blackwell, um, a collection of 661,000 bacterial assemblies. And we thought, this is a real test. Can we search on that? Um, And this made it harder, right? You can't just reorder that easily. Um, and you can't just run that quite so simply. And so, uh, well, we realized that you know, there, there are a few things we can do. There are some clusters we know a priori. And in fact, there are tools that are great at this that you can base, like there are tools which you can take fragments of sequences and run them through, and it will roughly assign them with reasonable confidence very, very quickly. So by taking essentially a vertical slice of this, um, what we were able to do is is starting is using a metagenomic classifier um, to roughly say, do a very coarse categorization, say what is everything kind of close to, and then slice it up into batches like that works reasonably well. Uh, the issue, though, of course, is that some of these clusters are gigantic. Some are really small. Um, so it didn't scale that well. And so uh, this is a technical thing that Corel did, but it's actually a really important side note. So, you know, we split we split these clusters into batches, um, depending on whether they were actually a cluster or whether they were what the metagenomic classifier calls a dust bin, which this is it turns out this is really, really important because um, when we did this naively, we just took every cluster it gave us and 95% of our computational time was on the dustbin. This makes sense when you think about it because the things, the diversity of nature is not uniformly represented in our sequence libraries. We have a lot, of, we've really heavily sampled salmonella, um, pneumococcus, a few other types of bacteria. And then there are these weird singletons and phages and random sequencing errors that manage to get into the database, all of these things. And what classifiers do is they tell you, okay, here are the salmonella, here are the pneumococcus, and here's a big batch of stuff that I don't know what it is. That big batch of stuff that you don't know what it is, that should have much, much higher internal entropy than any of the other clusters. So, you know, it it's one of these things that I've found both in experiments and in computation that when you when you take something small and then try to make it very big, um, different parts scale differently and things that you would never have expected to be a problem go very, very wrong and become your biggest problem. Uh, so while this seems like a very technical note of putting the dustbin into more clusters than the clusters themselves, it actually is critically important for things on this scale. And then for every batch, um, the approximate phylogeny with mash tree, and you, know, you can see we're flipping things around, literally just moving the order um, and then compress, right? So cluster, figure out the phylogeny, reorder, and then use a low level compressor. Um, and there's a lot, a lot of choices one can make here. Any of these things, clustering, compression, even how you do the reordering, there's a lot of wiggle room. We did all of these in sort of the night, in sort of super naive ways, again, because we wanted to make a point. Um, and I just wanna say before I show you well, I'll, I'll show you how well this worked for the EBI collections. Um, it worked pretty well. So uh, we were we were pretty excited about this. We got our 16.7 terabyte De Bruyne graph down to about 52 gigabytes this way. Um, we got the 805 gigabytes of assemblies down to 29 gigabytes. And, you know, works in assemblies, De Bruyne graphs, Kamer indices, uh, 
we even got it working on bloom filters because they all basically have the same principle. You know, put things that are more similar near each other and they will look more similar. And so you can compress them. I mean, really, in all of these, these seem so different, but in some very deep way, when you look at all of these, you've got a matrix in which one of the dimensions is object, is species, right? One of the dimensions is I have my sample. Either it's a bloom filter, a Kamer index, De Bruyne graph assembly, you've got species. Just reordering that so that more similar things are more close to each other, that's all it really takes. Um, we were we were really excited about this, so we uh, we thought you know the amazing thing about this is that fifty two gigabytes and twenty nine gigabytes. Yeah, our first thought was, oh, we can do all of blast on a we can blast all microbes on a laptop, and then we realized we could do even better um, because not only can you oh yeah, not only can you uh, put it all on a laptop, but in fact all of these indices fit on an SD card, which is within the weight limit of a carrier pigeon. <laughs> um, and so one of the things that remains in our to-do list, as soon as I hear back from the Massachusetts uh, pigeon, there is like a whole pigeon racing association there, um, is to actually try to send every microbial genome ever computed with every ever sequenced uh, on the back of a pigeon. Yeah, just as a as a totally random side note, and I'm, I'm sorry, this is not germane, but um, this is a really fun calculation to do. When is a pigeon faster than the internet? <laughs> um, it is a surprisingly long range because you know this pigeon can carry a with modern SD cards. You know, in the range of a couple of terabytes on its back. I think about how long would it take to send like two terabytes of data from here over to Simon Fraser? Like, yeah, hours, if not days, right? Like by far, if, if you have that much data that you want to bring over there, the fastest way to do it is to drive over there with a hard drive. But in fact, a carrier pigeon could fly there in that time. So there is some radius at which a carrier pigeon is in fact faster than the internet. Um, it's it's a fun it's a fun puzzle. Also, you know, a backpack full of hard drives. Um, all right, and then the last thing we were going to ask. Yeah. I have a question. Um, obviously, if I have to reproduce the slide, this one. Um, Not the pigeon. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so you go from 16.7 terabyte to less than 60 gigabyte, right? Is it a one way? Is it a compression one way? No, it's lossless. It's lossless. So you can recover whatever. You can have. recover completely. It is totally lossless. Okay. And obviously for the low level compression algorithm used, I mean, some are better for working with probably search. Right? Yeah. So that's that's an area that we're not, that we're trying to push forward. Um, we Ah, the question is, so there were two questions. The first one was lossless. First one was whether this was lossless. It's lossless. The second was that some of these algorithms are better for search than others. And um, the answer is we did do search and I'm about to tell you about doing search. It's kludged together and we can probably do better. So. Yes, some of these algorithms are much better for search, and I would love to do that. That's that's sort of where we are. <laughs> oh no, only ten minutes. Okay, no, no, I can do it. Um, can you do a better job with this fragment uh, than passing on the If you fragment, sorry, it's a better job if you fragment. And we order the sub I think, so the question is if we fragment the genomes and reorder the subgenomic fragments, can we do a better job? I don't know. My intuition is that for 
most bacteria, the answer is probably no, because there's not a lot. There aren't that many cases of bacteria where you've got two different bugs and this part of the genome is a lot like that part of the genome, but that one's really, really different. But each one of those is closer to something else. Like, because what? Yeah. I mean, if you have a lot of horizontal gene transfer, I could see it happening. Um, maybe. Yeah. Worth trying. How, how long does it take for the, uh, the data compression? In the data compression. Yeah, no, the data compression takes a long time. It's true. It's true. <laughs> um, but then we thought, can we search the data? Uh, and the short answer is yes, but I'm going to show you how. So basically, we did the simple thing, which is just roughly figure out compression parts, decompress that sub thing, look in it, keep going. Um, there are a lot of ways to do it, but we did what we call moth search, which uh, this... We're changing the name now. It's it's in another round of review, and we decided moth is maybe not the best way to do. Can you call it moth was for microbes on a flash, um, but I think I forget what we're changing it to. We're changing it. Um, yeah, no the the mega plate was originally called the OMG. Also, it turns out the the first name that you have that you think is so funny it usually goes away in in review, and I grudgingly admit that's a good thing. Um, Right. So I, I don't want to get to the details of this because you can look it up and I have 10 minutes, um, except just to say that, you know, we did this on a, we decided we would try to search this on a, um, on a iMac sitting in our, in our office. Um, and to search the ABI plasmid database, uh, we couldn't actually search. So we couldn't run this on the whole of the, we, we were able to search the entire bacterial database, but we don't, we didn't put that data in the paper because we had no referent because we simply could not do it. Um, even with our cluster with, with, um, other techniques, but for the plasma database, we found, you know, big Z took 2000 hours. Um, where we didn't even produce full alignments, whereas we were able to align to the plasma database in about 74. And yeah, um, so I just want to very quickly say, right, phylogenies are really, really useful for compressing. You can compress assemblies, indexes, everything. And now we're trying to figure out, okay, let's actually do real-time search because this should be possible, right? Like it should be, it just, um, and to search directly in the compressed domain or at least close to directly. Um, and use it for a bunch of things. So you can read more about this, uh, the preprint we, pub we published uh, this spring that should be coming out as a paper and not too long. Um, this is of course, primarily led by Corel um, but also we've been working a lot with Leandro Lima and Zam Iqbal, who wrote Big Z. So they've, that's been a really, really fruitful collaboration. And I've got like how long left? Yeah. Five minutes. All right. I'm going to tell you the small experimental-ish thing in the last five minutes, which is going the other way, which is instead of how do we build better algorithm or just how do we build better data structures? Can we do something practical with algorithms and find the algorithms informed by evolution? And um, this is something that was actually also done with Corel a few years back um, about can we predict antibiotic resistance? So um, you often hear about what a big problem antibiotic resistance is, and there's there's a lot of there's a lot of legitimate worry and a lot of hype, but um, one of the major things that keeps coming up is that even in these very scary plots of, you know, this is 
at least a decade ago, how what percentage of Canadian gonorrhea isolates were resistant to various antibiotics. While these plots are very scary because they're pointing up, notice the vertical axis. Resistance, in fact, almost never reaches fixation. And in fact, pan-resistant infections are very, very rare. And what this means is that um, a lot of the impact of antibiotic resistance is more would be solved not by coming up with new antibiotics so much as figuring out very quickly which antibiotic we already have works. Um, the reason that this is tough is that for most of the 20th century, and even a lot of the 21st, we're still doing it this way, where we take a sample, comes into a clinical micro lab in blood, you culture it in various different ways to figure out what if it grows on differential media to see what bug it is, and then you measure whether it grows an antibiotic to see which one works. And you know, if you're really lucky, three to six days later, you figure out which antibiotic you should have prescribed. Um, for this reason, for this very sensible reason, antibiotic prescription is largely ad hoc. What I would like to do is, is do it by sequencing. Everyone here is favorite hammer for everything. Um, because, you know, you can get species, resistance profile, and all these other things. Um, when I say challenges remain on both wet and dry side, I mean, first, it takes a long time to prep things for sequencing, oftentimes as long as culture, but I think we can get, I think there are ways to improve that. I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, and today I'm going to talk about computational progress. And remember, like, we don't, this seems really promising and like, yay, sequencing, but species is not super well-defined for microbes. This part is what I'm going to be talking about, resistance profile. Evolvability is not even a word, right? You type it in Microsoft PowerPoint, and like it gives a little squiggly underneath. It's, it's, there's a lot, but this, so the idea here is we noticed when we were looking at the phylogeny of resistance. So this is a plot of pneumococcus and the colors around the outside are which antibiotics the bugs are resistant to. And you look at this plot and the major thing you notice are these big streaks, right? So what this is telling me is if I care about say, is my isolate resistant to tetracycline or not, if I can tell you it's here or it's there, that's going to give you a pretty good yes. Or more formally, it's pretty cl clonal. Uh, actually, this came out of an observation that when you, when you do basically what's called MLST typing, which is just sorting bacteria into groups based on housekeeping genes, you can actually predict antibiotic resistance fairly well from that. Um, and just as a side note, this is not what you would expect if horizontal gene transfer were as common as it seems to be. So it's weird. But it, it suggests a diagnostic technique, which is basically guess. So we did the, again, you see a theme here. We decided to do the stupidest thing we could think of and just make a giant database and see how fast can we find something in it. And again, here, this point is, the question we're asking is, not reverse GWAS. We don't want to ask if I have a sample, is there a known causal mutation that causes resistance in it? We care about what are the chances this drug will work or not. These are not quite the same. And I can do that. Um, and we can use other knowledge. And I feel like you know, two years ago, this this was a surprising thing. You don't have to do reverse GWAS. And now in the age of, you know, everything being AI models, which are basically just rapid correlation, uh, this should be more familiar to you, right? If it kind of looks like stuff we've seen before, it's usually pretty good. So we made databases. This was a pain because um, it turns out when doctors measured levels of antibiotic resistance, sometimes they'll write just sensitive, resistant. They won't give you a number. And different hospitals at different times use different thresholds 
for this. Um, it was it was a pain, but we did it. Uh, and so then the question is, okay, how do we do it fast, right? Because Illumina sequencing still is slow. The fastest Illumina machine still takes 24 hours. That's not good enough. Um, and so I'm trying to see, is there an object around here that's about the size of a nanopore? How many of you have seen a nanopore sequencer before? Yeah, it, or like it's about half the size of this phone, right? Um, I, I'll often just like pull one out of my pocket, but I don't didn't want to didn't want to cross an international border with that. Um, and ha, so, how many of you have used nanopore data before? Right, when you use nanopore data, you usually think two things: it gives you really long reads, and they're really noisy. But there is a third thing that Nanopore does that no other technology currently on the market does, which is that it gives you reads in real time. Because this part of it, the business end of the Nanopore, this little thing here, is only like, it was 256 pores at a time. And so the molecules of DNA, unlike being read in parallel, the way an aluminum machine does, get read in series, one at a time. And that means you start getting reads immediately. And so the thought was, well, at first you get coverage, but it's really sparse. So if you could look for a signal that was spread out across the whole genome, you could actually answer that much, much faster, which phylogeny luckily is. So this was work with, again, with Carell when he was a postdoc in my lab, jointly with Bill Hanage at the School of Public Health. And basically, uh, the way that we did this was we took our database um, and then every time we got a nanopore read, we just chopped it up into k-mers. Carell had before this written very rapid hierarchical k-mer matching, a technique called profile, uh, which let us really, really quickly for every k-mer say which members of our database is it present in and which ones is it not. Then for each one of those, it got a vote. And then you go to the next gamer and you give one vote for every bug that it shows up in. And very quickly you get votes, you know, clustering on the bug that's right. Um, and from that, you can then say, all right, what's the closest, is the, the highest voted one, is that resistant or sensitive? What is the closest ancestor that has a different resistance profile so you can guess confidence. Um, and it turns out it actually works really, really well. So one of the things that surprised me was sort of not only is this quite accurate, um, but Carell, knowing that I like time-lapse movies, uh, made a time-lapse of the data where he showed the prediction with a frame every 10 minutes, just like my evolution experiment had. And it was the worst movie because it would start with nothing and then immediately was static. And I was like, Carell, what, what is this? This is not a movie. And it turns out when we looked into it, what was actually happening is um, there was enough data in the first minute to five minutes. So in the first 60 to 300 seconds of sequencing that you could actually, that your pr prediction converged. Um, and Carell, because he's, he's kind of a wizard, uh, wrote profiles so fast that it could actually make these predictions and vote faster than the nanopore was producing reads. So we could actually run this in real time as the nanopore was running. Um, that The hardest part of that by far was actually getting all the piping to work right in real time. Um, and it works about as well as this microdiffusion does. Um, actually, one of the really nice things is the thing it got wrong in Gonococcus, um, it actually, and Vernumo, the two things that it got wrong, it actually said these are low, these are low confidence. Uh, we tried it on some sputum samples and it sort of compressed sensing. So now as I'm out of time, conclusions. It's almost like I planned it. Definitely didn't. Um right. So so I think what I want to take home is collections of genomes have a lot of structure. They're not just a database of random strings. And the reason for this is that they all came from a common ancestor, or at least they share ancestry, they share an evolutionary history. And so you expect not only that 
not only that there's a lot of mutual information between related genomes, but that the differences follow a specific structure. Um, these are not one algorithm. I think the point that I've been, I've been trying to make inelegantly is really, it's the framework of doing this. It's the idea of let's use the shape of the data to compress, not the specific choice of BLAST or XZ or whatever. That's not, the specific choices are not the important ones. There probably are choices that are better than others but most of the power comes from just using the phylogeny. Um, and I just want to say for, for all of the, for everyone in the trainees in the room, you know, I just wanted to really dig home. Whenever you're building an algorithm to look at some data, ask where did the variation in that data come from? What's the, right? We are, we, as computational biologists are ultimately biologists. And we are asking questions of processes that occur in the physical world. Pay attention to what that process is because that process is where the variation, it's where the entropy that you do computation on comes from. And so by paying attention to that, I think there's a lot of gains to be had in better computation. So um, I just want to thank Karel, who's did a lot of the work in this. Uh, this is my lab now. I didn't show really any of their work except for Natalia quinones Olvera, who did some of the work on MOF. Um, and of course, collaborators, Zam, Leandro, Bill, Poru, and Bonnie, and the people who gave me money to do it. So be happy to take questions. I can't believe how well the timing worked. So you mentioned the amount of right? And, and we know that this is just a few of signals, not trees. Yes. So are you going to work with signals or you're working with the immune space? Because the camera chopping is just really speed. I mean, you have another process in between, which is a real function converts that signal to read. So the question was. The nanopore, the way that it sequences is looking at an electrical signal as the, is basically as a readout of an electrical signal that's read off by an ASIC as the DNA gets sucked through a pore. And that's just a plot. Um, that raw signal base calling that into reads takes another step. Are we looking directly at the raw signal level? And the answer there is no. Um, we could probably squeeze a little more out of it if we did that. But I feel like, you know, the sample prep to get from a patient swab to the nanopore takes about a day. Getting the nanopore ready to start takes around half an hour right now. And then we're able to predict in about a minute from there. Cutting that minute down is probably not a high margin use. I mean, I think really what I'm personally interested in is focusing on the wet side. Because I think, you know, part of the reason that it takes 24, 36 hours to go from a sample to nanopore is that that's never been the limiting step before, right? Sequencing has always taken longer than sample prep. And so I think you know, just looking at how sample prep's done, there's a lot of ways you could do it faster. And maybe you could do it twice as fast, but make your data 30% worse. So now, okay, you save eight hours on sample prep, but now it takes, you know, seven minutes instead of five minutes to get enough data. So I think that's the game that I really want to start playing is how do you do faster how do you do faster, worse sample prep? Um, because, you know, it, it's sort of a weird question, right? How do you do sample prep when you don't care about quality? Um, and you really, you really don't care about quality. We did as a side thing that didn't appear in this paper. Um, we tried to see, could we predict on the reads that the nanopore said were such low quality, it didn't even want to show, its, show them to us. And it worked real quick. 
I mean, it didn't take, it took maybe twice as long. So like, you know, three minutes instead of one and a half, but it was shockingly fast. Um, and it's just that, you know, it just, you don't need that many cameras in there to make a good prediction. There was another question. Um, to, in the room or Zoom? Um, did you find any unanticipated complexity or difficulty when adding new genomes or sequences or old images to the complexity? Uh, you discussed in terms of your thoughts. Yeah. Um, I don't know. So we didn't really try iteratively adding genomes, honestly. We haven't tried that yet. Um, yeah, I think this dustbin question was unexpected versus being very small. So presumably at some point between let's look at 100 genomes and let's look at 661,000, there is some marginal addition where the dustbin becomes a problem. Um, but I think we sort of jumped past that and just went, you know, at the time we did this, it was all the sequences. So we didn't do any experiments with adding things. I mean, do I expect unanticipated complexity to show up in the future? Uh, absolutely. Um, there's another question at SFU, but I'm going to take one of the questions here at UBC first. Yeah, I was curious about, um, you mentioned you had a vision of sort of hierarchy doing a lot of this, and it seems like that is the underlying structure. Um, I was curious if you'd gotten much further into sort of hierarchical compression, or if there was a big bottleneck on that. So the question is, have we gotten further into hierarchical compression? Um, not that much. So there is some. Um, so there's a little, where can I find it? So this, yeah, this two-step is sort of, is sort of it, but it's not quite. And I think we tried some experiments. So this project originally came up of just trying to do data compression, not search. And we tried to do some hierarchical compression with the data compression, and it didn't make a ton of a difference. I mean, there's, so, you know, there's some argument to be made that this reordering is hierarchical, but it's kind of hand wavy. Uh, in terms of have we done things hierarchically on the search side of it, no, and I think that's what we need to do, right? Like being able to rule out large areas very, very quickly. Although, yeah, I'm not totally sure, right? Because the big batches, you know, if you could do, if you could pick a centroid of these big batches and compare to that, you probably, pretty good at ruling things out. Although as Zoma was saying, you're ruling out whole genomes at this point. So you can't quite do it because it might be horizontally transferred. So uh, the, so the short answer to your question is, no, we haven't. I would like to, it's not gonna be trivial, but it feels like it should work. Um, and then I s s lost the chat. Ah. The question at SFU. Um, Go ahead. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was a really nice presentation. I do have a question about uh, how will we implement this prediction of AMR, especially uh, if we are taking a phylogeny as, as the database? Is it important if we are taking a look at the local phylogeny because for instance, let's say that we want to implement this in an ICU and we have like a regional transmission or we know- This is a great question. We have yeah. pretty characterized or um, like- Yeah, this is a great, this is a great question. We, we asked this, we did end up asking this question in the paper. The question is, um, do you care? So the question is essentially, <clears throat> do you need specialized databases for local, for localities for prediction? That's right. Yeah. Um, our expectation was that the answer would be yes. So we tried uh, pre 
using the Massachusetts pneumococcus database to predict pneumococcus on patients from England. Um, it did better than we expected, but it seems like you do get better you do get better performance locally, but not as much as you'd think. Um, that may be because pneumococcus is a respiratory pathogen and so it traverses the globe very quickly. But yeah, ideally, you know, if a single hospital or single region stored all of the data, all the sequences of every of every bug that's come through regionally, that should be a better predictor because that's more representative of the population. Uh, in practice, you know, this is something that really that really confuses me as an evolutionary biologist because it it really seems like resistance is way more clonal on a global scale than you'd expect. Um, even which plasmids things carry, even though like in Klebsiella, there are plasmids that can easily jump between any Klebsiella, but you always see them in the same strain and nowhere else. Um, there's, I don't know, there's weird stuff and I don't understand it. So it intuitively, you're absolutely right. There should, it should work better if you're looking locally for your training data. In practice, it works surprisingly well. I mean, I have to say, we did not expect any part of this to work as quickly or as effectively as it ended up working. Um, and I think the fact that it works more quickly and more effectively on more generalized, or sort of on longer distances than we would have expected is probably telling us something very deep about the evolution of antimicrobial resistance. Um, and I don't know what that is, but I want to. Thank you very much. That's pretty interesting. Um, can I follow up and ask you if you have plans of just doing like an implementation trial of this? And especially if you have found any kind of resistance in providers about just trying to do it a different way and especially trying to take the power um, into the like. So, yeah, so we... We are we are spinning this back up now. Um, what happened, honestly, is that Bill, so Bill Hanage and I were, um, we were on a call with a group who was going to potentially start commercializing this and really running actual trials um, in January 2020. Um, and Bill, I believe this is a photo of him from one of his media appearances, has become a very uh, well-known epidemiologist of SARS-CoV-2 in the U.S. And this basically, you know, derailed both of us for for several years. Um, so we're trying to get back to it now, working with, you know, I think the our strategy is not work with providers directly, but rather work with clinical micro lab directors because they like this, or at least we have a couple in Boston we're working with who, who do, um, and then try to get it working from the clinical micro lab first, and, you know, get it working from that side. And yeah, I've been learning a lot about how clinical micro labs work and it's very eye opening. There is just for all of you in, for all of you doing computation, there is there is so much data flow happening in hospitals. Like so much of modern medicine is an information management problem that there's just, there is, I mean, there people are, are storing samples or like databases that any of you would think is a gold mine, just like in a closet because they felt like it. I mean, it's like the amount of data that goes through hospitals is unbelievable. So I think, you know, as a field for those of for those of us who who never thought about it before, like like I had, we need to start talking to doctors. We need to start getting into the lab and getting that source of data because there is so much medicine. There's so much information in medicine that is waiting to be processed, to be learned from that you just can't otherwise. Sorry, I went off on a tangent. Oh, thank uh, you. Yeah, I we'd love to do this. I, I actually think, you know, where I'd really like to go with this is 
you know, we're trying to, if you think about what we're actually doing here, this database is built on, did the antibiotic kill the bacterium in the clinical microbiology lab? But again, that's not, it's still not the question the doctor actually cares about, which is, will it work? And so what I would really like to do is actually, you know, in, in the, in the dream world where NIH gives me money, any of it, especially an unlimited amount, um, conduct, conduct a trial where we actually look at outcomes. And instead of training on clinical microbiology lab outcomes, train on patient outcomes. And rather try to rather than try to predict um, what is my bug like, predict will this bug and this drug work based on whether it's similar sequences and similar drugs have worked in the past or not. So actually no. There is no more time. Thank you very much. Thank you, remote people in the screen over at SFU. See you tomorrow. And thank you, Michael. I think I speak for everyone here. That was a really striking presentation. Um, yeah. Okay. All right, so I just, should yeah. I quit out of the Zoom?